UTD officially was opened, I mean, we brought in the first students in 1975. And they were very much interested in developing the concept of interdisciplinary studies. Which is I was there when it opened. Yeah. I am the director of the Center for Translation Studies. Okay. I teach courses on the art and craft of translation. I teach workshops on translation. I teach courses on the very recent development in world literature that includes works that have come in from all countries in the world, but mostly the emphasis in my case is on the modern era. We have texts that come in from the Arabic world, the Chinese world, obviously Europe is still the strongest part, and especially right now Latin America. Courses. Okay. I also teach a re one required course for graduate students that is uh, approaches, interdisciplinary approaches to the arts and humanities. And right now I am particularly interested and we're running some seminars with one of my colleagues about translation in the digital age. And that I see will be a major contribution to the field of scholarship and academic future. Sure. I believe that the general attitude is these days that the, the students believe and think that everything is owed to them. These days everybody expects to get either an A or a B. There's a different attitude that a student thinks because he or she just sits there, that means they're doing good work. And it, it, is, it is a disease. And I, as an instructor, I spend so much time seeing the weak students through rather than spending time with the very, very good students because they're extremely sensitive and they always have a feeling not to bother the instructors. When you have what we would call, you know, very good students, you really have to go out for them. And I've always thought that this was my function as an instructor at a university. To look out for the... For yes. the Whenever a very, very good student has serious problems, I come into the picture and I go. And you take care of the problem? Yes, I do. I do. And I have a new policy again. And the policy is, if a student comes, I shake hands with him or her. And if the hand is very cold, ice cold sometimes, then I know they're very nervous. You, you don't immediately enter into the discussion of the topic or the subject that needs to be discussed. You talk about something else and uh, put them a little at ease, if possible. Because when you start out with a student and tell the student something negative to start with, the screen comes down and they don't listen to you anymore. Okay, so, yeah. so now it's 37 years, 30 75, 38 years later. Mm -hmm. How many of the the pioneers, such as yourself, are still there? Uh, that's a good question. I believe there are, in the School of Arts and Humanities, I believe there are two plus me. From the beginning? Yes. yes. Wow. Yes. And uh, You must have, have tenure by now. Well, I came with tenure. <laughs> that was funny. Uh, I'm guessing you're not from these parts. No, not at all. I was born in Germany. I grew up with the American Army. The Americans came on the 8th of May in 1945 when... Uh, when we were in shelters. We spent a lot of time in shelters while the bombs were coming down. We had a house on the hill, and the house was one of the first ones to be occupied by the American army. So they gave us 20 minutes to get out. Then we were allowed to go back. Where did you go when you were out? In a camp? In street. A we lived in the street. And then we had one room for seven people. Nobody who has not lived through this has no idea what this means. Uh, it's, it's, it, it haunts you for at least 10, 15 years or 20 years. It haunts your dreams. The Americans came, there was a valley. The Americans came eight days too early. 
And so it was a valley, the Americans came this way, and here was our shelter, the bunker. There were 500 people in that. And then the Americans thought that these were the Nazis in there, or whatever, the army. So they started shooting, and so what we had to do is we had to put the napkins together. And I would put the napkins together, what we had, because we had to get a white flag. To make a flag. Yeah, and we got a pole and we put it on that. And then somebody had to take it out. So my older brother took it out. Wow. And then as he was walking out there, the, 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 the bullets came like this past his ear and he fell. But he still had this thing up. I was seven, eight years old, so he was 12 or so. What happened is we all got out and the, the you know these small airplanes, the double ones? Mm -hmm. The biplanes? They were, yeah, they were flying above about a thousand feet be, above us. And we were going up the hill, and obviously, which was stupid, but we were saying, you know, we are women and children. have changed and uh, a lot of the students think that everything is indeed owed to them and uh, however I, I just hope that they will never have a crisis you know? it's not likely but no but yeah. when you see you know this little you know see West Texas mm -hmm. you know or you see uh, you see Boston right could be your brother your son your sister whatever and it changes life from one second to the next. And we, I mean, I spent a lot of time as a child in basements when the bombs were coming down. It, it was a different world, Stuart Perman. Yeah. It was a different world, and it's no sense. You know? If you think you have a story to tell, send me an email. But I have to tell you up front, it better be good.